Praise the Lord. Welcome home, everybody. Thank you for joining us this Sunday at the Bethel Church of Christ Holiness. I'm Pastor Carnell Borden, and I'm so glad to have you with us on this Sunday. Amen. We pray that you will help us lift the name of the Lord, and I, if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men unto myself. That's the Lord's promise, and we want to do our part by lifting him up this morning. So please join us in this time of pray, praise, prayer, worship, and hearing the declared word. Amen. Again, always honored to have you in our presence. There's a blessing in this place for you. There's a blessing in this place for all of you. And even though you may not see it, the Lord, he knows you need it. Please believe me when I tell you there's a blessing in this place for you. Amen. I hope you believe it this morning. Amen. We're going to ask Sister Precious Michael to lead us this time in our praise and worship medley for the morning. Amen. If you know the words, please sing along. God bless you.
But all the time, God is good. Amen. Thank you, Sister Michael, for leading us in that time of praise and worship. Amen. We want to uh, honor a couple of birthdays this month. Each month we honor the birthdays of our members as we have them on record. Again, if you are in our membership, this is your birthday month and you're wondering why we haven't acknowledged it. It's because we do not have that in our records. Please contact the office and make sure we are aware of it. Amen. We thank God for Sister Sarah Harrison. Uh, her birthday is on the 4th of this month. So happy birthday, Sarah. Of course, that's the daughter of Anita Benjamin. And then, of course, we have the birthday of Joy, Joy Moran, on the 8th. Amen. Happy birthday, Sister Joy. Amen. Joy and some of her other family members were uh, celebrating the birthday of yet another member of the family when the news of uh, Bishop Richardson broke. So they are together making plans, making arrangements for his homegoing celebration. If you haven't gotten the word yet, I'm going to give you uh, the information on that. So make sure you are ready to make note of it. We posted it on our Facebook page. For those of you who are Facebook able, you can also see the information there. And I know others are making that announcement in their social media uh, posts also. Bishop Richardson's homegoing services are going to be on Saturday, this coming Saturday, August 7th. Uh, they are going to be at the Metropolitan Baptist Church that is in Altadena, California. The address of the Metropolitan Baptist Church in Altadena is 2283 North Fair Oaks Avenue. 2283 North Fair Oaks Avenue. Again, that's the Metropolitan Baptist Church, Saturday, August 7th. The viewings will be at 10 a.m. So from 10 a.m. to just before 11 a.m., uh, there's going to be viewing. At 11 a.m., the services will start in earnest. So 10 a.m. viewing, 11 a.m., the homegoing celebration will commence. And the family wants you to know that masks are required. Masks are required. Please bring your mask with you. All ushers are asked to serve. All ushers, particularly ACLCH ushers, uh, are asked to serve. I believe Sister Beverly Meadows is in charge of organizing you, and you're asked to wear black and white. Amen. So ushers, you're asked to wear black and white. We're going to need ushers to help serve uh, during this homeboy celebration, so we pray you will respond accordingly. Amen. Let's remember that this is Communion Sunday. Um, so we are going to partake in communion today. Make sure you have yours available. I would recommend that you have uh, two months of supply worth in your home at any given time. So uh, govern yourselves accordingly. If you need some more communion supplies, please contact the church office. All members, please contact the church office. Amen. In terms of having services on Sunday, my plan is to be here every Sunday to do the service from here. I am not launching a reopening of the church in full, in part because we're having some work done on the ceiling. It is not finished yet, which causes a lot of dust in this place. And I'm not sure that it's, it's uh, suitable for having uh, full services. However, you are uh, invited or able to come and join me on these Sunday mornings uh, right here in the sanctuary. Uh, there's enough seating for us to be socially distanced. We do ask that you mask up in the sanctuary. Bring your mask with you. If you happen to forget, don't sweat it too much. We do have supplies on hand. We do have hand sanitizer uh, on hand. We do have the seats marked as to where you can sit, where the yellow tape is and things like that to make sure we're appropriately socially distanced. We want to be responsible, but we also want to come and praise and worship the Lord as we can. If you do not feel comfortable coming, we are continuing our Facebook live stream. We are continuing uh, our teleconference line, which is open right now, and we are posting our services to YouTube immediately following um, the end of service. So you have all these different ways to get to us virtually also, amen. We wanna encourage you to do that sometime in the very near future when there's a better handle on all this, um, then we will announce our uh, 
relaunching of full services. And I want you to know I still have in mind to celebrate our church's anniversary uh, this year. 106th anniversary this year. Amen? All right. So you've heard the announcements. Please govern yourselves accordingly, particularly to the announcement about the homegoing celebration of our dear Bishop Richardson. We do want to celebrate his life. So we do encourage you to come and come with the spirit to uplift the name of the Lord uh, and to uh, encourage and support, amen, the family. Amen? All right. Um, I think that's all that I have in the way of announcements. If you have other announcements we need to make, something that I've overlooked, please contact the office so that we can get them into the hearing of the audience. Amen? All right. We are going to, uh, at this time, prepare for the preached word. Uh, as we approach that time, I'm sorry, I forgot prayer. Just remember that. So I'm going to have a time of prayer. Uh, I want to acknowledge uh, our sick and shut in. As always, Sister Viola Swan, uh, Sister Bethune uh, Johnson, Sister Grace Rice. Amen. We want to acknowledge Sister Gladys Mickleberry and Deaconess Korea Staten. Amen. We want to pray for all of those. We also want to pray for Sister Deaconess Ware's mother, who suffered a fall and she went to, amen, to be with her. So we are praying for Mother Deaconess Ware, praying for you and for the family as you attend to her. God is able, amen. The fervent effectual prayer of the righteous availeth much. Great things happen when the people of God pray, particularly when we pray together, amen. There are others that we are praying for. We continue to pray for you. We continue to lift you up. We continue to lift you up, Tyree. We continue to lift you up, uh, Elder Pastor Smith. We continue to lift you up, uh, Deaconess Brackenridge, um, and, and all of those who uh, are sick and shut in. We may not have your name, but God knows your name. And when we pray for God to touch, please know that you are included in that request. Let's go to the Lord at this time. Father, we thank you for your loving kindness. For your grace towards us, you have been wonderful to us, better to us, yes, than we often are to ourselves. And we are so grateful for that undeserved kindness, that favor that you show us. We come this morning to lift you up and to magnify you and to declare your goodness to one another. We come to encourage one another to love more uh, as we are counseled in the word. And so as we are here we know your spirit is in our presence. And though we are united virtually, we are united spiritually. And that's what's important. Lord, meet us where we are. Do what we need done as only you can do. And we glorify you for it. For those who are suffering, Lord, because of sickness and affliction, uh, because of mental anguish, because of situational pressure, we pray that you would bring healing and deliverance in the name of Jesus. God, we trust you now. What you've done before, we know that you will do again. You've healed before, you'll heal again. You've delivered before, you'll deliver again. You've made whole before, you'll make whole again. We trust you, God. For the names that we called out, we trust you. We trust you for their situations. We trust you in the midst of all of our trials, troubles and trials. Uh, tragedies. We trust you to bring comfort, Lord, to uh, support us, to uplift us, to encourage us, to strengthen us. We trust you. We trust you in the furtherance of this service to make manifest your presence among us, God. As your word goes forth, we trust your Holy Spirit to minister to our hearts exactly where we are so that we might receive exactly what we need. In Jesus' name, as we go forth, we give you the glory, we give you the praise. Thank God. Amen. Praise the Lord. We're going to encourage you as we prepare for the message and song to turn with us to the book of Matthew, the gospel according to Matthew, chapter 5. The gospel according to Matthew, chapter 5. We're going to encourage you today to be light. Be light. Let's say amen as the message and song comes at this time. Oh, bless God. Bless God this morning. Thank Him for His grace and his mercy. Truly, it was his grace and his mercy. And I have to say, we got a new dose of that this morning. We got a new dose of that. 
this morning and for that I'm truly grateful. So I'm just going to sing this song as we are anticipating a word from God through our pastor, Bishop Ward, and uh, I know God is going to sing a mighty word today. Let's thank God in anticipation of it.
your grace and mercy. Amen. We give honor to God, our Father, Jesus Christ, who is head of the church and head of our lives. To you, saints, members who are here, we get to have you all here with us in the actual sanctuary. For those of you who are listening, uh, either by live stream, YouTube, or on teleconference, glad to have you all with us today. Amen. As we prepare for the preached word from chapter 5 of the book of Matthew, Matthew 5, we're going to be looking at verses 14 and 16. Let me just say that I want to include in our prayers this week, prayers for the Richardson family who are flying in, coming in from all different uh, points uh, in the country to lay Papa to rest. We want to pray for them, that God would give them traveling grace and mercy. <clears throat> they would have safe and comfortable passage here and back home, and that God would comfort and console the family. All of us, really, because we're all family. Amen? Matthew chapter 5. Looking at verses 14 through 16, I'm going to read to you from the King James Version. Ye are the light of the world, Matthew 5, 14. Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick. And it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father, which is in heaven. Be light, be light. Father, we thank you for your loving kindness and your grace towards us. As we meet just now, Father, we pray that you would uh, be in our presence as you promised you would be, as we come with one accord and make your word known to us in a way that causes us to be better examples of Christ, better representatives of your kingdom. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Matthew chapter 5. Be light. Be light. Uh, one of the, the great challenges in life is to change. In fact, it's 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 kind of comical how much we, and I include myself in this, I'm, I'm as guilty as anyone, really, how, how difficult we, or what, what kind of difficulty we engage change. We seem to be resistant to change, I guess is what I'm saying. There's a certain comfort in having things be the same. And it, and it makes sense if you think about it. One of the reasons why we're so comfortable with not changing, even when things aren't good, is at least we know what things are. We understand our situation. We have mastered our circumstance. It's not the best space that we're in, but we understand that space. And so at least we can navigate it with some kind of proficiency. We, we understand what's before us. We know what we need to bring to bear to get things done. It's not the best situation, but hey, we're going to make it work. Change requires us accommodating the unknown. Change means we're gonna move into a different space. Now we're not familiar with that space and we don't know what's facing us. And perhaps the most difficult part of change is that we don't know if we're up to it. When I get to my new situation, am I up to it? Am I enough when I get there? What kinds of new capacities, capabilities, abilities, gifts, skills, talents, will I have to cultivate, nurture, and develop in order to prosper in this new space? Nah, I think I'm good where I am. Again, it's not the best situation, but I'm good where I am. And, and that's, that's what we call complacency. And complacency is an insidious foe because you slide into it without knowing. It's not like you wake up every morning going, I'm gonna be complacent today. No, you wake up thinking, I'm going to get some things done today without realizing what you're doing is adhering to a routine and a schedule that's always been that way, and you have not accommodated anything new into your life. And if you think that's difficult, what if I were to talk to you about changing yourself? Because here before when I talked about change, it sounds a lot like I'm talking about my routines, my schedules, the things that I'm doing, maybe my job, the way I do things. But what if I said change also applies to the person? What if I said it's also hard to change yourself and perhaps it's even more so to change yourself, to be changed? And as I started to say at the top, it's comical because 
Change is the thing that we resist the most, but is the most common feature in life. Everything changes. Trees change, birds change. The very house you live in changes. The wood gets older. <clears throat> when the house was first built, it was solid and silent. Now it's aged and noisy. You step on one of the stairs and it cricks. Things start falling off the wall. The paint start chipping. We call that change. When you bought that new car, it was quiet and efficient. Now it's not as quiet. You hear little noises here and there. And slowly but surely over time, your 35 miles an hour has become 32 miles an hour has become 30 miles an hour, and now it's a solid 28 miles, I'm sorry, miles per gallon. Uh, why? Because things are changing. People change. And even though we resist change, there's some change we can't stop. I used to have hair. Mm. Amen. Mm -hmm. I didn't fire, did it quit? <laughs> change. Change. I don't stand up as straight as I used to, I don't walk as fast as I used to. Change. And my body didn't ask my permission. It just happened. I do have some agency over that if I exercise more and incorporate some stretching activities into my routine, I can keep my body a little bit more limber and I can re get back some of that bounce and some of that speed, but even that would require change because I would have to alter what I do and how I do it to accommodate this new behavior. Change is hard. Change within oneself is even harder. The scripture says that when we come into Christ, old things are passed away and behold, there will be change or all things become new, same thing. But when the Bible talks about change, it makes this quantum leap from change of routine and change of behavior and change of attitude to something that I will call, for the sake of this conversation, radical change. Transformational change, right? When Paul talks about change in Romans 12, 2, transforming the mind, he uses the word metamorphi. If that word sounds familiar to you, it's because you've heard it before, but you've heard it in a different way as metamorphosis. And when I say metamorphosis, what comes to mind right away? The butterfly. And what do we know about a butterfly? It starts as a caterpillar. And then one day, this radical change begins. Did you know that when that radical change begins, the, meta the metamorphosis begins, the caterpillar instinctively, it is not capable of cognition or thought the way you and I does. There's something in it that just says, get to a tree, get to a tree, get to a tree. And then when it gets to the tree, there's something in it that says, climb the tree, climb the tree, climb the tree. The, the, butter, the, the caterpillar doesn't know why it's doing all this. It just knows it has to. If it were able to talk and you were to say, why are you moving so quickly now? Why are you climbing that tree? Because I have to. Because I have to. And then when it gets to that certain point on the tree, it begins to break down. Anybody here ever break down before? Yeah, I have to. Change. Change can break you down. And while breaking down may sound negative, it doesn't have to be negative. It could actually be positive. Ask the caterpillar. In the middle of its metamorphosis, if it could talk, and if you were able to have a conversation with it, and you, you say, what's going on with you, bro? The, the caterpillar will say to you, I, I don't know, just everything's different. Things just aren't what they used to be. Everything's different, and I just seem to be breaking down. Anybody ever here tell somebody I'm breaking down? I'm, I'm, I'm breaking down. But it's a good thing because it's about to come forth as something more beautiful than it's ever been before. And its new form will allow it to soar to heights it's never seen before. It won't have to climb trees. It'll fly over trees. And, and the things in the organic environment that used to be a threat to the caterpillar are no threat to the butterfly. 
Because now the butterfly can just fly over its enemies. Change. It can be radical, it can be painful, and from the outside, it can look awful. Another fear we have about change. How am I going to look? Can I keep my swag during my change? Can I keep my cool? And sometimes the answer is no. Sometimes the answer is no. Sometimes it's going to look like you are changing. But that's okay. Embrace the process. When Jesus here talks to them about being light, he's actually talking about this in Matthew chapter 5. This is the beginning of his ministry. One could argue the disciples were no more capable of, of being light at that point than anyone. They didn't know anything. They had just begun their journey with Jesus. But he says it to them affirmatively, not aspirationally. And what I mean by that is he doesn't say you will be lights. He says you are light. Trust me, my notes have none of this didn't plan to go here, but I guess I got to go here. You are light. And it's important for all of us to understand that call, God calls us some things that we don't often feel like. Like I don't, there are times I don't feel like light. I don't feel like I can show anybody anything because I'm at a point in my life where I'm not certain of some things. And yet Christ says of me, you are the light of the world. I think that's interesting. Let me go a little deeper into that just for the next few minutes and then we're going to go to communion service and we'll let you go. When Christ shares these words with the disciples in Matthew 5 verses 14 through 16, he's establishing three truths that we need to understand. He's telling us who we are and that's verse 14. He's telling us what we do as believers, and that's verse 15. And then he's telling us why we do it, and that's verse 16. Verse 14, who we are, what we do, why we do it. These are the consequential questions of life. When you sit in your quiet space and you're trying to figure out what you're doing with your life and why you're here, here's your answer. Here's your answer. This is who we are, this is what we do, and this is why we do it. So, who are we? Well, verse 14 says that we are lights of the world and we are cities on a hill. It talks about purpose and position. Lights of the world, purpose. City on a hill, position. And when we're giving this, it's a description of the doer and not the deed. Being a Christian is more than what we do, it's who we are. Being a disciple of Christ is more than what we do, it's who we are. We do not work our way into the kingdom. We are saved by grace. That comes to us through faith. Not of ourselves, but it's a gift of God. So our salvation truly is a gift that is based on our faith in receiving it. Not our works. That is not to say that we shouldn't work for the Lord. In fact, we should. In fact, true salvation promotes a desire to work for the Lord. But don't get it twisted. When Christ talks to us, he talks to us about who we are. Hence the need to change as a Christian. Which is why when we come into the kingdom, we can't be what we always were. Those things have to pass away and everything about us becomes new. Everything about us becomes new. What do you mean, Pastor? Well, I mean just what I said, everything. Your attitude, your perspective, your behaviors, your desires, your aspirations, your goals, your appetites, your affections, your relationships. How you do your job. They become new because we've changed. We are something different. We are now lights of the world and we are cities on a hill. Those are awesome privileges, but also awesome responsibilities. Amen. Awesome privileges, but awesome responsibilities. When Christ says, ye are the lights of the world, in the Greek language, he uses a very specific word for ye or you. You are the light of the world. It's a reflexive form of the word. He's literally saying, you yourself, you yourself are a light of the world. Please don't look around and expect other people to do your job. You need to navigate this world as though you are the solitary means of transmitting the message of the gospel to them. You need to understand that without you, people are going to be lost. Your life has 
substance. It has urgency. It has meaning. Why am I here? For that reason. Because the world is dark and needs a light and you're it. You are that light. Everything about you speaks Christ. Again, your attitude, your perspective, your behaviors, your, your aspirations, your goals, your relationships, how you do your job. All of that is light in a very dark world. In John chapter 17, verse 4, Christ is praying to the Father and he says to him, I've given them, I've fed them with your word. And in the B part of the verse he says, so they are not of the world. They are not of the world. They're cut from a different cloth, Father. They are different than the people who surround them in their communities. They are not of the world. That is to say, they are essentially something else than what the majority of people are. Well, Pastor, why did you say majority? Because the Bible says that straight is the gate, narrow is the way. And few there be that find it. Few, few, few. Just a few people are going to walk the righteous and true path in life. That means the minority of people. So this minority of people are essentially different. They are different in their essence. They're made up of something that is quite distinct and unique from the majority. You, we need to understand that as Christians. We are made of something completely different. What we are as people is different. Yeah, we bleed the same blood, and physiologically, we're all pretty much the same. But I'm not talking about that. Because our lives are more than our bodies and our physical appetites. We are soul, and we are spirit. We are heart, and we are mind. And all of those components of ourselves are completely different. Or they are supposed to be. We are not of the world, cut from a different cloth. Ephesians 5, 8, 8 says... For ye were sometimes dark, but darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. Both in Ephesians through the Apostle Paul and in Matthew and also in Luke through Jesus Christ, we hear the words that ye are light. We were darkness. It is not just that light inhabits us. We are the light. What we do is light. We may not like it, but the world has the right to judge us. We want them to judge us, but we want them to judge us as being righteous, which means we have to be righteous. The writer tells us in the scripture, don't be ignorant, don't be fooled. Those who do righteousness are righteous. There's no deep revelation here. To do the things that God bids you to do. To walk according to his will and his way is to be righteous. When we say walk, it's a euphemism for live. Think the way Christ thought. Treat people the way Christ would treat people. Have a relationship with the Father the way Christ had a relationship with the Father. Adopt the mission of the Father the way Christ adopted the mission of the Father. Lo, it is written of me in the volume of the book, I come to do thy will, O God. What is my life about? about God's will and how it plays itself out through my hands and my feet, my heart, and my mouth. We are light. So that's who we are. Whether we like it or not, that's who we are. Christians are to live a high-profile life. There are no secret agents in the kingdom of God. We're all out it. We're all out it. There are no clandestine operations. We're all out it. We are very bold in our faith and how we live it out. Okay, then, so what are we to do? Verse 15 says, we are to light the house. I love that. I love the King James Version of it. It has a certain poetic ring. We are to light the house. Another way of saying that, however, is we are to be lighthouses. Every Christian household should be a lighthouse in its neighborhood and in its community. People should walk through that home and experience something they don't experience in other homes. I take great pride in the children who came to our house, sat at our dinner table when they were invited by our children, and noticed something about our family that was different than even their own family. That's a testimony, and that should be true of all of our homes. When I'm in your presence, something different is happening than I experience in other places. What a beautiful feeling to walk this planet knowing 
That I can bring something to others' lives that they can't get otherwise. Love, peace, joy, wholeness. This is what it means to be light. This is what we do. We are light. John 1, 5 says, light shines in darkness and the darkness cannot overcome it. Sometimes we feel so heavy laden in life and we feel like the devil's winning. That's just the feeling. Shake it off. Light cannot be overcome by darkness. As a matter of physical law, all darkness is is the absence of light. Darkness and light are not two competing forces. I know we think of them that way, but they're not. There's no competition. No, when the light comes on, the darkness is vanquished. There isn't a conversation. If I were to turn these lights off right now and turn them back on, they would not ask permission of the darkness to come in. Wherever we are, there is light. There is no transaction between us and darkness. The scripture actually speaks to that, that there could be no communion between the two, no fellowship between the two, because light is always superior to darkness, because darkness can only be where light is not. So if you are the light, there will be no darkness. Are y'all following me today? Remember when we talked about light before and Jesus says, here's how I know their life, Father, because I fed them with your word. They are walking by your precepts, their behaviors, their attitudes, their perspectives, how they do their jobs are based on your word and your will. And whenever someone's in the presence of somebody who's living like that, that presence will be impactful and significant in their life. Why? Because there's so little of it in the world, so little love, so little peace, so little joy, so little compassion, so little true hope, that when you encounter it and it's authentic and it's real and it's vital and vibrant, it makes you take notice. So that's what we do. We are lighthouses. Lighthouses mark dangerous coastlines, shallow waters, reefs, rocks, safe entries in the harbor. Lighthouses orient you. I believe it's in the Gospel according to John chapter 3 where Christ says that men who live in darkness don't like the light. And he, he explains the reason why is because the light exposes their darkness. That's what the lighthouse does. The lighthouse says, look, rocks, look, reefs, look, the water's shallow. Be careful as you navigate your ships, your relationships, your fellowships. Be careful as you navigate your ships. I'm a lighthouse. You're a lighthouse. We help others see the darkness in their own lives to navigate the dangers in their own lives. When you look at my behavior and then you judge your own behavior, you should be able to see there's a difference. We are lighthouses. And finally this before I get to my last point, we stand before the epiphanies of Christ. What is an epiphany of Christ? It's the manifestation of Christ. When Christ is born, that's an epiphany of Christ. We get a version of Christ that is swallowed in human flesh. And being swallowed in human flesh, according to Philippians 2.8, he makes himself, he submits himself to death, even the death of the cross. Now, we focus a lot on that B part, even the death of the cross. But before it says even the death of the cross, it says that he submits himself unto death. That is to say, at the moment that, that Christ, the only begotten of the Father, takes off his eternal form and puts on this mortal form, he now is subjected to the physical processes that bring about death, like aging. And he does that voluntarily. That's the first epiphany of Christ, the, the frailty of human flesh swallowing the divine form. That's the first manifestation of Christ. The second manifestation of Christ is the post-resurrection Christ where he gets up out of the grave and conquers death hell in the grave. And so sandwiched between the frailty of the human form swallowing his divinity and his post-resurrection form is you and I. We are sandwiched, sandwiched squarely in between those two epiphanies of Christ. We are, we are no longer something, but we are not quite yet 
something else. We have died to the world, but we're only alive to Christ through faith. It has not materialized in our final, eternal, glorious form where we inhabit the space called heaven for all eternity. We haven't gotten there yet, but we're on our way. And while we're on our way, we're showing others the way. We're sandwiched between the two epiphanies of Christ. The frailty of his human form swallowing his divinity and his post-resurrection exalted form. We're in between those two. You and I are. You and I are. And we're showing the world the way because we are the light. Because that's what we do. You see. That's what we do. Yes, we can knock on doors and share tracks with others. We can enjoy formal evangelistic efforts and missionary efforts. But at the end of the day, your most powerful ministry is just you living your life. Just live your life. It's the way that, that you deal with conflict. It's, it's the way that you manage and nurture your relationships. It's the way you go about your everyday duties with a spirit of excellence. The way that you can be relied upon because you're consistent. The way that you can be relied upon because you have integrity and you're honest and you're trustworthy. All of that is just you being a light. It's what we do. And when others say, why don't you give that person a piece of your mind? Why don't you tell them? Why don't you clap back? That's not what we do. And then finally this. Verse 14, who we are, lights, city on a hill. We live our lives conspicuously for others to see. I ain't got no secrets. They say they're, they're looking at you on the internet. Let them look. The government's spying on you. Let them spy. I don't have anything to hide. What do we do? We're lighthouses. We're showing the world there is a better way to live. And then finally this, why do we do this? Verse 16, so that men may see our good works and not give us credit, but glorify our Father which is in heaven. John 3, 20, light exposes evil. Just my presence. Anybody, I always tell the story when I'm preaching sermons like this. You ever go to a family reunion? If you're a Christian, you go to a family reunion. I know it's true in my case. And uh, I like to play dominoes. You know, I pray for them. I like to play spades. And so whenever the domino game going on, play spade game, I'll sit down at the table and play. And the moment I get there, the, the beer cups go into the table. People stop talking. They stop cursing, telling jokes. All of a sudden, I'm a preacher here. I like that. I like that. Because my presence is exposing the darkness. If me being around you makes you change your behavior, I'm good with that. I'm okay. I'm okay. If me being in your life helps you to improve, I'm good with that. Because that's just what we do. But why do we do it? So that our Father might receive the attention. Because at some point, somebody's going to ask the question, there's something different about you. What is it? Oh, you just opened the door for an awesome story about a man who came to live this life, to show us how to be reconciled to the Father. And then one day he gave his life to pay the penalty for my sin. And then three days later, he rose again. Let me tell you the story, because that's why we do what we do. First Peter 2, 9 says, you are a chosen race. Look at all these things you are. You're a chosen race. You're a royal priesthood. You're a holy nation. You're a people for God's own possession, that he may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. So that you might proclaim the excellencies of him. To know truth is to know Christ, to know beauty is to know Christ, to know good is to know Christ, to know love is to know Christ. To know any of the higher virtues in life is only to know Christ and you yourself are a light to those virtues. And you need to understand there are many in your family and among your friends and co-workers who will never know those virtues but for your presence in their lives. You cannot afford to be quiet about Christ. Because literally, somebody's life depends upon it. So, as I wrap this up, I ask you this. What kind of light are you? Are you a Christmas light? 
just mere decoration, no true utility? Are you a flashlight? You shine intensely for a moment, but if you're on too long, you run out of power. Are you one of those intermittent blinking lights? Sometimes off, sometimes on, sometimes off, sometimes on. Depends on what day I catch you, what time of day I catch you. Or are you a world lighter? You sit high in the sky like the moon, reflecting the light of Christ. Are you like a brilliant star, a beautiful being that reminds those who see you of the awesomeness of your creator God? What kind of light are you? Get lit. Now, I know that means something different to some of you. But in the context of the sermon, get lit. Be filled and led by the Holy Spirit. Simply be light. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your loving kindness and your grace towards us today. And as we are in your presence, Father, we know that all light has a power source. Fire has the fuel that it burns. Solar-powered batteries are powered by the sun. Devices are powered by alternate current, direct current. We all need power to be light. And your Holy Spirit is that power. And we pray, God, that you would refresh that anointing upon our lives so that we can shine brightly in our life's constellation so that those who are around us may see what we do and how we are and ultimately glorify our Father, you who art in heaven. Have your way through our lives. That's our prayer. If you're under the sound of my voice and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, we do give you opportunity to do that too. Day. It is not my job to convince you to come to Jesus. The Holy Spirit has already done that. All I'm going to do is help you to understand the processes by which that is accomplished. The Bible says that if we confess him with our mouth and believe on him with our heart, we shall be saved. So, if you are ready to join the family of faith, if you are in this hour where you understand that you have not totally fear with God, that is to say, you have not truly submitted and surrendered yourself to Christ, and that you are not uh, convinced that heaven will be your home, but you want to be, you want to be. Let me say to you, you can make that confession today. I'm going to pray with you a prayer of repentance because everything starts with repentance. Acknowledging your sin. Acknowledging your change of heart and change of mind. And asking God to come in you, to dwell in you by his spirit. It all starts there. And then we're going to give you some instructions after that. Would you pray with me? Repeat this prayer if you're deciding to give your life to the Lord Jesus. Father God, I thank you for your grace. You have been kind to me, even though I have not deserved it. And I acknowledge that now. I was born in sin. But since I was born, I have committed sin. There are things you've asked me to do that I didn't. There are things you told me I should not do that I did. I repent of my sins. I turn my back on that life. I want to face you. I want to know your will. I want to do your will. I want to be with you forever in glory. Fill me with your spirit. Give me understanding that I can't get on my own. Give me power, authority that I can't get on my own. I am your child, and I am made so by the blood of your Son, Jesus Christ, my Lord, my Savior, my soon-coming King. Thank you, God, for saving my soul in Jesus' name. Now, having prayed that prayer, I invite you to go find someone immediately. Don't wait. Don't do it tomorrow. Don't do it later tonight. At the very first available moment, if you're listening to this at work and you're on your post, I'm not asking you to leave your post, but I am saying make it your business as soon as you take that first break to find a loved one, to find a co-worker, to find a friend who you know loves the Lord Jesus. Confess to them what you have done, that you give your life to Jesus. Ask them to help you to find a Bible-believing, Christ-serving church so that you can truly be a functioning part of this family. God bless you and God keep you is our prayer. Welcome to the family. For the rest of you, we are going to enter into our communion service just now. I am going to read to you our communion scripture from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, after which we'll have a prayer of our communion elements, these, so you want to have these ready, and then we're going to take them together. Amen? All right. 
1 Corinthians chapter 11, starting at verse 23. For I have received the Lord that which I uh, also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he break it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup, when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood, this do ye as often as ye drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chasing the Lord, that we should not be condemned with the world. Wherefore, my brethren, when ye come together to eat, tarry one for another. And if any man hunger, let him eat at home, that ye come not together unto condemnation. And the rest will I set in order when I come. Father, I thank you for this time of commemoration. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your sacrifice as it was made on Calvary's cross. And because you shed our blood, we your blood, we recognize that we do not have to die eternally in our sin. We are so grateful for that gift of grace. As we partake of uh, this bread, Father, we remember your body beaten, broken, bruised for us. As we partake of the fruit of the vine, we remember your blood shed for us. We know the word says there can be no payment for our sins without the shedding of blood. Thank you for shedding your innocent blood as a lamb led to slaughter for us. As we partake of this moment, Father, we remember your gift in Jesus Christ. Amen. We're going to do this together. Amen. We're going to partake of the bread together. So we're going to peel back the very top plastic part to reveal the wafer. Hold the wafer. We're going to take it together. We're going to take it together. Give you a moment. This is the body of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, broken for you and I. Let us take it together. In the same manner, they partook of the cup, with Jesus saying, this is the New Testament in my blood. Pull back the hard tab. Far enough, just so that you can get the drink out. This is the shed blood of Jesus Christ, shed for you and I on Calvary's cross. Let us drink it together. Always a special moment when we can take communion together to remember why all of this is possible. Because Jesus paid the price for our sins. God bless you. God keep you. Thank you for being with us this Sunday. Until we meet again on this side of the other. Be safe. Be blessed. Behave. Thank <laughs> you.